In a previous video, I showed how I made a set of custom grips for my 1911. Today we'll be making a new set in aluminum. So we're going to hop right into the machining, then talk about some of the metal finishing that I did, powder coating, and at the very end of the video I'll cover the cam. With that being said, let's get started. We're starting off on the back of the grips. You may have noticed that my stock looks a little thick. I'm using some scrap that I had left on hand. I'm removing the bulk of the material with an 1164th drill bit before running the boring operation for the counter bore and the through hole. I'm using a two flute eighth inch end mill from Lakeshore Carbide. Hashtag not sponsored. Next, we'll remove the tool marks by running a 2D contouring operation. Uh, Tim, I can still see the tool marks. Yeah. I neglected to leave tooth out for the boring operation. My bad. But thanks for noticing, Art. I decided to rough out the undercut for the safety using an adaptive tool path. And this actually worked out pretty well. Cleanup is done with a eighth inch ball end mill cutter with a five thou step over. For the last stop, we have some engraving to do on the backside. Well, that didn't capture my design intent at all. Apparently, I changed the tool but forgot to change the program. Off camera, I made another set. I'm often asked if I'd be willing to share the CAD models that I used to make my fixture. If you stick to the end of the video, I will show you exactly how to get them. Before moving on to the more interesting side of the grips, we have to establish our work coordinates and touch off the tools. Before we can bolt down the grips, we need to machine some counter bores for the screws. Whatever you do, please do not forget to adjust your retract height. You need to clear that bar unless you like spending $25. Ha, you thought I was gonna hit it. Sorry folks, one crash per video. If you have hopes and dreams of one day making your own grips, my one important safety tip is, use small pan head screws. You do not want the top of that screw to protrude outside of your part because if the mill cutter catches it, it's not going to be pretty. The facing operation is not necessary in aluminum. However, in wood and composites, the cutter tends to rip material out of the grip during the adaptive tool path. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here in just a few moments. And speaking of the adaptive tool path, we're running that right now with a quarter inch three flute end mill from Lakeshore Carbide. In other videos, I often refer to this one as my Billy Baru because it is my favorite cutter for aluminum. So I know what you're thinking. Only a true nerd who's actually bred would publicly claim that he has a favorite mill cutter. For the three of you who care, I'm running this cutter at 7,500 RPM, 2 thou feed per tooth, with an optimal load of 50 thou. My fine step down is 10 thou. What I'm looking for are nice little steps all the way across the part before I go into the smoothing operation with a ball end mill. This is the final pass that will gouge out the material if you leave way too much during your adaptive process. And after a quick 2D contour of the part, we're done with the Billy Baru. Now it's time for the 3D parallel path. You may have noticed that the cutter is moving vertically across the part with a 5 thou step over. I normally run this path on the grip at 60 degrees. That way I'm always cutting across that 1 thou step over. The 60 degree method yields a better surface finish, but it just takes longer. And today I wanted to see if I could take a little time out of the grips. This op actually took a little over an hour. I really should take these opportunities to go and help out the wife unit. <laughs> but again, I've already bred. 
While we wait, check these out. I gotta tell you, I was not entirely unpleased with how these came out. Even Skylabella is saying, are we done yet? I did actually go fold a load of laundry during this op. You know what they say, happy wife, happy life? Although I do think we could medicate for that now. At this point, we have a blank canvas. Grooving and checkering can be whatever your little heart desires. And the programming is really easy. Again, I'll cover that later. For the grooving, I'm running a trace operation with an eighth inch ball end mill. My axial offset is negative 10 thou, and I did this with two depths of cut. I know that most of you don't really care about the feeds and speeds, but I include them in my videos in the hopes that maybe I'm going to help one or maybe two people. But please feel free to share your thoughts on the topic in the comment section. I really would like to know. For the final operation, I'm using a 5mm tapered ball end mill. I prefer this tool over the traditional 30 degree chamfer tool, but that's just me. Again, checkering pattern can be whatever you want it to be. I honestly just keep playing with it until I like it. I'm not entirely unpleased. I can tell from the analytics on YouTube that this is the point in the video where most of you leave. But before you do, please hit the subscribe button. I'd appreciate it. So my process for metal finishing consisted of starting with a 400 grit, moving to an 800 grit, and finishing with a 1500 grit. I then scrubbed the part with a scotch brat pad until I was happy. And that took repeating the process at least three times. I also did a little stone work. Final polishing is done with Blue Magic. I got this trick from Clickspring. It was relatively easy and I was amazed with the finish. After polishing, I rubbed the part within an inch of its life with a Ken wipe until the Chem wipe was always clean. Here you can see the difference of using a Ken wipe for final finish. Anodizing would have been the obvious choice right now. However, I'm not ready to go down the anodizing in the privacy of your own home rabbit hole quite yet. I do have the ability to put a clear coat powder coat onto these parts, so that's what we're going to do next. My process begins with a denatured alcohol bath, followed by some time in the oven to outgas the solvent. Doing my best to lightly coat the part with the clear coat powder coat. Then I place the part in Timmy's Easy Bake Oven for 10 minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're done. I decided to only powder coat one of the grips because I wanted to see if I could tell a difference. It actually was really hard to tell the difference, but the grip on the right is the powder coated grip. These are really test grips, so we'll see after a year if we can tell a difference in the finish. I was so happy with the process, I ran it on both of these. I'm really pleased with how these grips turned out. And a quick safety check, because I do not want to be like Alec Baldwin. In my last grip video, I mentioned that these grips would really benefit from some blue oxide custom screws. Tormach apparently was paying attention and sent me this. If you're kind of wondering how that'll all turn out, please feel free to subscribe. Oh, and don't forget to hit that like button. 
I'm Tim from Last Bastion Labs, your safe space for makers. Thanks for watching. So this is the technical section for the three of you remaining who are interested in making your own grips. First, the fixture. If I had it all to do over again, I'd make it wider for the clamps, or I'd make it taller and add T-slots and screws to attach it to my bed. Here's an image of the panhead screw that I used in my fixture. Again, you want it flat. If you're interested in saving yourself a little bit of time, head on over to CG Trader and download my fixture and a set of blanks for $25. The 3D models are in step format, so they're easily modifiable within Fusion 360. I'll include a link in the description. Here's a better image of the fixture in the grips. One word of caution on the slot used for the safety. This seems to vary slightly from gun to gun, so you may want to run a test cut if you're fitting it to a gun to make sure that you have it correct. Now we'll rehash the cam and I'll go through a few of the finer details that I didn't cover in the video. Again, the facing operation is just used to take out that extra stock and make it a little bit cleaner for the adaptive path. Here's the adaptive, followed by the contour, and then we go to the 3D contour of the part. You'll notice here that the tool never goes down into the hole, and this is a very, very important safety tip because if the tool catches that screw, it's going to rip it out and rip the part out, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So what you need to do is in your edit and go down to the bottom and select those surfaces as do not machine. And I think I gave about a fourth out standoff from them also. You can vary, play with that however you want. Now I'll show you how I did the grooving with a eighth inch ball end mill. Went into design and set an offset plane off of the part and then scribed an arc across my grip. I then put a point out in space and made a pattern, circular pattern, around that point until I got it to go 360 all the way around. And I just played with this until I found something that I liked. Move the point, move the spacing, move the curves. When I was done with what I liked, I went ahead and ran a mirror pattern on the other side. Now, within this same sketch, we're going to go ahead and project to surface. And you only need to select the curves that you want. There's a lot of videos online showing you exactly how to do this. This is just kind of documenting what I did. Now all that's left to do is to go back into the cam, select trace pattern, and select those curves and give it whatever depth that you want. In my case, my axial offset was uh, 10 thou, and I ran two depths of pass. Then I ran a parallel path with about three quarters of an inch step over to get the straight diagonal lines all the way up the part. Here you can see the curves that I selected. For the checkering, again, I'm using, in this case, a 0.5 millimeter ball end mill cutter. And I'm just running a parallel path with the spacing that I put into it at 105 degrees and an axial offset of uh, 2 thou. <clears throat> again, this is just something you can play with. You can change the angle, you can change the depth, you can change the cutter. But all you have to do is select the perimeter, enter in your angled offset, and you're good to go. My other trick is, once I've done one pattern, I go ahead and copy it, and then go back in and change the angle to the negative degree so I get the same pattern in the opposite direction. Lastly, you'll notice that my cutter is coming straight up out of the part. 
there's a setting that you can change because if it's too close together, the cutter will go from one to the next and it will leave a pattern in your part. You want it to come out. And we do that by going into our linking page or the very last tab on the right and change our safe distance and our maximum stay down distance. In my case, I'm running 0 0.08 and 0 0.2. The last stop that I do to tie in all the checkering is go ahead and hit trace and then select the outer perimeter of the part and use the same axial offset that you used when you did the checkering and this will allow the cutter to actually go all the way around the part and kind of tie in those endpoints. If you're just starting out in machining I want you to know that you actually can do this. It's not that hard, there's lots of references and we all started from a baseline of zero. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you actually got to this part, leave me a comment and tell me what you thought because I don't normally do this in videos. Good luck and have a great day.